Oh, we have a lot of times where we think things are going against us, times are hard. And today we're continuing on a series that we're doing in Cranbourne campus on the book of Numbers. And today we're at a time where we're dealing with what is it like to be in a wilderness experience? And I'm sure many of you will be sitting there going, yes, we live in Victoria, we know what it's like. Well, I want to go through this journey today and see whether we can understand a little bit about how we can deal with it and how we can become overcomers through this time. I've entitled my message today, Declarations That Defeat Us. Too often what happens is things around us happen and then we give in to them. They actually control us. And we suddenly find that we are no longer in control of our life, but we are now being controlled by those around us. There's been many declarations made. Some of them have been lived up to. You know, we all make jokes about when the elections are on, lots of politicians make promises the day before they get elected and forget about them the next. Well, let me tell you this. The declarations that we make today will either give us a good future or will haunt us for the days that lay ahead. See, too many Christians today are defeating themselves because what happens is they start to speak out of the negativeness of the world around them. The greatest struggle for most Christians is their declaration, how they declare what they are about and how they are living their life. And so I want us to go through this journey because, see, Today, as we struggle with this thing of the lockdown, you know, in the days that lay ahead, we're going to look back at this and ask some questions. What did we do for this journey? What have we learned? And how are we victorious? See, some of us say that we're in a wilderness now. And of course, there's been many movies created about various people who've been stuck on islands and had to survive through the time. And yet, as we look at each one of those, they are different. But there are some similar things there that we can learn from. In fact, today, as we look in the book of Numbers, we're going to learn of a journey of what it is to be stuck in an area where they don't understand. But to give us a better understanding, first off, we're going to have to retrack again just to understand the journey of where Israel as a nation were at. They had just been held up in Egypt as slaves. They were there building buildings. They were creating bricks. They were the downcast. They were the ones that had no hope, no future. And they cried out to God. And the most amazing thing is God heard them when they prayed. Yet, even though God heard them, God set them free, they still struggle with the whole meaning of what does it mean? And we're going to just pick up the story in Numbers 13 to start with is where Pastor Norma last week gave us a great insight of the story of what happened. But I need to recap so we can understand it. In Numbers number 13, sorry, Numbers 13, verses 1 and 2, the Lord said to Moses, send out some men to explore the land. Well, their promise was simple. They were slaves in Egypt. Now they've been given a land and they were going to come into it. So in preparation, go and explore it. Check it out. Now, verse 26, they came back to Moses and they reported the land that you'd sent us to. It does flow with milk and honey. And here's its fruits. They were excited about what God had promised. They could hardly believe it because they kept boasting about how big things were. Now let's go down to verse 28. And I love the first word, but the people, but. Do you know, when you hear someone say, but, that means something's not quite how they all perceived. And this is what they went on to say, but the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. And we even saw the descendants of Anak there. Hang on. But all the problems are this, this, and this. Who are these descendants of Anak? They saw them as giants that were ruling the land. And they said, we can't do it. Hang on. But they've just had the miracles where God brought them through some parted waters, fed them so far, gave them some water so far. As you go back, he brought them out where they were slaves and they came out not just being slaves set free, but everyone came and gave them gold and livestock and all these things. And suddenly from being slaves, they had nothing. They were blessed. And now just a few days later, they couldn't believe God was going to take them any further because they looked at the situation around them. 
and they were stuck with it. It goes on a little bit further, verse 30. Then Caleb silenced the people. This one guy, Caleb. You know, one of the things that Pastor Norman said last week, which I thought was really interesting, they set out 12 spies to check out the land to see what it's about. Now, I bet you can't remember any of their names. Why? Because they were negative. You can't remember negative people. If you want to be remembered, don't be negative. In fact, there's only two positive ones. One was this guy, Caleb, and the other one is Joshua. And both of them we're going to speak of. See, in verse 30, it says, And Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Today, that should be the attitude of us as Christians. We can certainly do it, because if God is for us, who could be against us? That's what we see in Scripture over and over again. But verse 31 goes on. But we can't. They are too strong, the people keep saying. The land we explore devours those who live in it. I think it's interesting. They're there having a great time, enjoying all the fruits of the land. But they saw that those who lived there were getting devoured. It goes on. And we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. They could only see the problems. They could see the limitations. They could not see the hope of God. Now, I want us to go into this journey now in Numbers chapter 14. And I encourage you, get your Bibles out, because I'm going to look at many of the passages, but very short, of course, sections of them. And I want you to get a picture of what it is for us to travel through a time where we seem to be in a wilderness, not knowing what's what. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 1, that night all wept aloud. They all started whinging and complaining and it goes on there, and they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Do you know what happens when things don't go the way you want them to? You start to blame others. See, I bet you've even been in a church at times where people say, oh, oh, this person hasn't done this, or that person should be praying more, or this. And we start to speak against the leadership. Well, that's what they did there. They suddenly could not perceive that God would do what he said he would do. And so it's all Moses and Aaron's fault. Actually, I thought it was God who brought them out. It goes on there. If only we had died in this wilderness. Hang on, I'm not quite sure I want to die in any wilderness. I've got too much life to live. They wanted to give up because it was too hard. Yet, they actually hadn't done anything. They've only gone over, checked it out and come back but they had created a story in their brain that said it is too hard. Then they went on to now start to blame God and says, why is the Lord God doing us or bringing us to this? He should have just given it to us all. I don't know if you ever thought about this as parents. Are you parents out there? Do you just give everything to your kids? Do you wait on them hand and foot? Do you make sure that they are able to get a breakfast early and they pack lunch and that? Or do you actually get them to do something like play their bag or make their own lunch or help prepare a meal? See, if we don't learn on the journey, then we become lazy. Here they are. They've already been brought out of the wilderness, brought through all this, brought right to the edge of the promised land. And they said, God, what are you doing this for? Where are we? Let me tell you today, God is bringing us to great things, but we've got to get past this questioning God's leading and questioning his authority. We've got to realize that God is God and he's got the best plan. Goes on further in that verse. Wouldn't it have been better for us to go back? Go back to what? They were in slavery. They were struggling because they were getting beaten. They were getting killed because they didn't work hard enough. See, too often we are saying things like the old was better. In fact, I remember some time ago, I was talking to a guy who had given his heart to the Lord and he'd gone through this journey and he'd come to a point where he goes, I'm not sure whether my old friends are better than my new friends. I'm not sure whether. And they started to question in their brains thinking, what is? That's where they are. What if we went back? Well, what was back? Slavely rejection. Without Jesus, guess what's up there? slavery rejection we've got to be bigger and start to see that god has got a plan for us but what happens when things go wrong we don't understand we seem to be in a wilderness 
people don't understand. Our relationships are struggling. Our work's hard. We, you know, we can go on the list of things that seem to put us in a wilderness. But I want you to get this. I want you to declare this. The Lord is with us. So what did Moses do? In verse 5, and Moses and Aaron fell down on their face. What does that mean? They cried out to God. They didn't care about what others were doing. They started to pray. See, the truth is this. If there is issues in our life that are not together, we've got to start to focus back on God. Get into the presence of God. It goes on to verse 6. Joshua and Caleb said to the entire Israelite assembly. In other words, now not only Moses and Aaron, but Joshua and Caleb start to stand up. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. So the truth is, we need to start to speak out what God says to us. If God is for us, who can be against us? What promises has he given to you? Well, he's promised us a healthy life. He's promised us a blessed life. And today, we too often try to say our blessing comes from the government or our blessing comes from our boss who pays us or something else. Let me tell you, our blessings come from God alone. Nobody else can give us blessing. And we've got to start to speak into what God is saying, not into what the world is saying around us. The next point I want to bring up is this. The Lord is with us. And you've heard me say this many times. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Today, we hear it in the church many times. People rebelling against the Lord, saying, oh, I want to do it this way. I want to do it this way. You know, too often we say that we see people saying, oh, I'm not rebelling against the Lord. I'm just not going to tithe. I'm not rebelling against the Lord. I can smoke and drink and get drunk all the time. I'm not rebelling against the Lord when I go out and party all the time. Oh, no, let me tell you, that is rebelling against the Lord. We need to be what the Lord is saying about us. Do what he says to us. And he goes on there and says, do not be afraid of the people. Here the Israelites were struggling because what was happening is they were looking at the people. Today, through this process, there are many people saying, this is how a Christian should act or this is what they should do. We need to see that God is greater in us than what the world is around us. The world has no authority. God has authority. God created the whole world as we know it, just by speaking it. And yet too often we just allow the world to dictate to us how we should think. Again, Caleb's and Joshua's words fell upon deaf ears. And the mob even spoke of stoning them. Isn't that amazing? When men and women of God start to speak out boldly and declare good things, Guess what the world wants to do? Stone them. You know, over the process of time, we've seen many times when Christians stand up for good, somehow someone can turn around and say, oh, that's bad. Well, don't get surprised because guess what? They hated Jesus. They'll hate us also. See, those who speak the word of God, those who speak life, will be criticized for a time. Moses was criticized for a time. Caleb and Joshua were criticized for a time. But you know what? If we would just stay true to what God's called us to, then we will see great things. Next thing I want to bring to your attention is this. We've got to be careful we don't treat the Lord with contempt. I'm sure not one of you would say that you've ever done this in your life. But I want you to just to look at this passage and see what does the Lord redeem or see as contempt? In Numbers 14, it goes on there in verse 10. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. So now it's Caleb, Joshua, Moses, Aaron. Then notice this. Then the glory of the Lord appeared. So when we start to speak about the authority of God and people start to rise up against us, guess what? The Lord will rescue us. All through the Bible, we'll see many times where People have risen up. The Lord has brought a form of rescue. God will always turn up. And what he's looking for is faith. But it goes on there. In verse 11, it says this. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? God saw what was happening as contempt. What was the contempt? Well, simple. 
They were disobeying. They could not trust God. They did not have faith that God would deliver them. See, contempt is, in male thinking, different. But when God says it is, I have given you everything. Take it. Live in it. Don't question about the issues and the problems because I will bring it through. And if you do, that is contempt, not trusting. Verse 12 goes on there. And as soon as things change, I, God, will strike them. And I'll make you into a new nation, greater and stronger than they. Now God's turned back to Moses. And he says, these guys are so bad, I'm just going to wipe them out. Get rid of them. Even though I've rescued them, I've brought them this far, I can wipe them out. I can start a brand new nation with you, Moses. You're going to be the new daddy of everybody. And so from you, the world's going to be blessed. I'm not sure whether that was God's real heart desire or that was a test. Because see, all through the scripture, we see many times this sort of thing happen. And what it is, it takes men like Moses to stand up and declare that he's not going to allow this to happen. Why? Why did Moses say that? Because he was taking the heart of God and loving the world. Just like Jesus came, he loved the world, even though it was a sinful world. Moses was amongst a sinful group. I'm sure if we looked around us, we'd say there are numbers of people who are sinful around us. See, when things go wrong, that's the time where the Lord's strength is displayed. God will always come through. Now we get on to verse 13. Moses said, Now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you have declared. We need to be bold enough and speak out. Let the Lord declare. Let the Lord show. Let the Lord bring forth. And we need to be ones declaring it out there. Speak out the promises of God. If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 18 goes on. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sins of these people. Moses is now talking back to God and reflecting back to God. You are a God who forgives us. If it wasn't for the forgiveness of God, what hope have any of us got? If it wasn't for the grace of God, how can we achieve anything? Today, we need to understand God is a God of forgiveness. Our job isn't to judge others. Our job is to love and forgive. Let's go on. Contempt negates the promise. So this is one of the saddest things of this whole journey. The children of Israel have been rescued by God. They've been given a new hope. They've been brought now right up to the doorway of being into the promised land. But yet they could not believe. Contempt negates the promise. Verse 20 goes on to say, The Lord replied, I have forgiven them. That's good. God's forgiven them. But down in 23, no one who treats me with contempt will ever see the promise. The truth is God has forgiven, but the trouble is there's consequences to our lack of faith. God always brings forgiveness, but it is us who will allow the blessing to come into our life. So they came to that time where they could not trust God any longer. But yet there was one who stood up. And it goes on in verse 23. And this is the challenge for today. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. I want you to get that picture. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. Do you know how we can measure Caleb's different spirit? Not because we can look inside, but we saw that he followed. He committed himself wholeheartedly. He never questions the things of God. He just knew that this was the direction. The children of Israel now were going to be led back into the wilderness. Forty days they had traveled right up to this time to come into the promised land. But because they could not believe God, 40 years now they were going to be back in that wilderness and live there for the rest of their lives. Miss out on the fullness that God has got. But Caleb had a different spirit. He believed God full heartedly. But not only he, then it says, and his descendants will inherit it. Caleb will inherit it. 
his descendant. He started a legacy. For those who are following through our reading plan, if you haven't got it, get it down off our website. It's talking about how do we create a legacy. See, the purpose of what God is doing is not just for one generation, it's for many generations. He brought Israel out for all of the Israelites. He blessed so that your descendants will be blessed. Today, your children can be blessed. I want you to start a legacy, whether it be your natural children, those that you work with, the schools, the businesses you're involved with. I want you to see that God is well able to use you as a starter of a legacy. And tomorrow they set forth to the wilderness. All those who were not listening to the will of God were led back. You know the sad part about it? Caleb and Joshua trusted God. Moses and Aaron trusted God. But because of the disbelief of all those around, they actually all went back into that wilderness for a period of time. Their unbelief led them back into reliving the wilderness over and over again, like the Groundhog Day, over and over again, because they could not trust, they could not see. So the truth is this, freedom isn't free. I want you to hear that again. Freedom isn't free. For Israel, it took a Passover lamb and a wilderness for them to get into freedom. For Christians, it took the death of Jesus, a crucifixion, but also the death of ourself, giving up our rights to put our trust in God. Freedom isn't free. It actually costs us something. Freedom requires effort. See, following the Lord in the wilderness was not easy. In fact, following Jesus today, some will say it's not easy because we need to take the scripture, know what it says, and do it. That means often self-sacrifice, not seeing ourselves as number one, but seeing God as number one. And so freedom requires effort. Freedom also requires risk. Freedom can be very messy we make bad choices they did they saw the enemies they saw the problems but we've got to be vigilant we've got to be ones that say i'm going to stay true right through see proverbs puts it this way keep your heart always with diligence keep strong keep looking forward in 1 peter 5 and verse 8 it says there the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking anyone he can devour the devil's out to trip us up to cause things to look hard Why do we see things looking hard? Well, because the devil tells us it's hard. See, in the wilderness, there was temptations to ignore God's instructions and to go their own way. Today, in our life, there are temptations to ignore God's will, to follow our own way, to do what we want, put our focus in money, put our focus in pleasure, sports. We've got to put our focus back in God. See, the truth is this. We've got to be willing to pay the risk. I just want to leave you with some words of a guy who's King George the Sixth of England. He addressed the British Commonwealth on New Year's Eve, right back in the 1950s. And on the New Year's Eve, of course, they'd just come out of the war time. They're trying to rebuild their nation. And I couldn't help but look at these words and think, boy, how do we see the future? What is the future for us? Do we want to return back to the old? Or we look into what is ahead. The head might seem scary. COVID might seem scary. Loss of business might seem scary. But is God calling us forward? Let me just read these words. This is King George the Sixth, and he just made this statement as a declaration of them moving from one year to the next. I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I might walk safely into the unknown. And he said to me, go into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of God. It shall be to you safer than the light and better than the no. Today, we need to put our hand in the hand of God. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what's around the corner, but we know one thing. If God is for us, who can be against us?
I look forward to seeing you in church.